you fuck for worldwide communism? Uh, am I in charge of the communism? No. <laughs> None. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I'm Austin. And I'm Max. We're just getting the uh, giggles out of the way uh, before we really kick into this episode, because we're talking about a hell of a movie, and we don't want any stupid jokes messing this thing up, okay? Okay. All right, Max. So uh, what movie are we talking then. about? We're talking about uh, Jacques Demy's 1970 film, Donkey Skin. Podon. Podon, as it's said in Francais, but... Yeah, can you tell that I took like two months of Duolingo yeah, you gotta get French back classes? On your Duolingo <laughs> French classes before the the guilt trippy owl stopped bothering me and I stopped. The abusive taking... owl started sending the gaslighting me... <laughs> owl. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're we're gonna keep the. I'm owl gonna cancel out of this. the Duolingo owl for being a toxic abuser. Oh, like, I bet that that's happened already. Um, but Max, this movie's great, regardless of how terrible we are at speaking French. Um, and I'm glad that we were finally able to sit down and watch it because we've. I don't want to say we've been teasing this movie, but like this is one that's been on our list for a while, and I've shown you different clips of it, and I know you've been really excited to finally sit down and yeah. Visit so, this. in the twilight zone space of between episodes, when we're sort of deciding what to do, and you're pitching me different ideas, and I shoot them all down, you put on this for me, and uh, visually, I instantly fell in love with it. How could uh, you not? Yeah, it's yeah. it's a beautiful dreamlike experience to watch this film that being said having watched it have yeah twice now and having sort of had time to reflect on it i'm not entirely sure how i feel about this i love it visually there's absolutely nothing i would change about the film visually but i i did leave the film with a sense of just like this wasn't the direction i thought the plot was going into I was kind of expecting more of a tragedy of errors to the point of comedic farce. That's the vibe I got from the beginning. You thought it was going to be kind of campy in a different way. Yes. Yeah. Um, where it kind of just falls into a standard fairy tale structure after a certain thing. Yeah. Which is the vehicle for this amazing dreamlike yeah. reality. It begins and it's up in your face mm. with this incest stuff. And you're like, what? This, and it's not even just like, the horrific nature, like the incest, like the desire for incest from the king, but like just the increasingly like insane requests from the daughter. I thought that was going to escalate. I thought everything was just going to like explode. Yeah. You thought that was going to be the premise of the movie. Yeah. Not turn into this thing where she's like in the woods, in the yeah. woods. And uh, it's literally just like the most standard fairy tale ever. And I'm fine with that as a vehicle for this movie. It's just, it took me off guard for a second. Yeah. And I'm I'm still processing a bit, but I'm excited to see more stuff by Mr. Demi now. And, and we definitely will. And the good news about that too is I wouldn't even say this is one of his absolute best movies. I would say that I really enjoyed this movie and I think it's incredibly well done. But he's got like, especially throughout the 60s, like what what a decade for like any director, one of the great decades of any director's career. He made about like three or four real like masterpiece level movies including um probably one of the best debut films of all time lola uh really incredible movies that we're definitely going to get to but this movie i think you're in line with a lot of other critics and kind of myself as well where this this movie catches you a little bit off balance um and i think part of it has to do with its kind of like laissez-faire attitude towards the incest <laughs> um which I guess we should just explain for anyone who's not familiar with this movie. This is a fairy tale movie about a girl who has to flee her father, who is the king, after her mother dies. And her mother says to the father, to the king, uh, as she's dying, you must grant me this one wish. Do not remarry unless it's to a be woman more beautiful than myself. And then the king is like, I can't find a woman more beautiful than you. I can never remarry. And then who's more beautiful? The daughter Oh, no. It's like your wife, but younger. Oh, God. So, yeah, you think the movie's going to be like either one of those horrific fa old fairy tales that's like, yeah. and then he fucked his daughter oh, and God punished God him for damn. his sins and he turned into the new donkey that shits gold. <laughs> yeah, something, something like yeah. that. There's also a donkey that shits gold. Yes. Yeah. Um, hence the donkey skin. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> I thought that was going to be like the general yeah. vibe of the movie. Just... Yet again, horrific to the point of farce. Yeah. But then 
the movie goes in a different direction. Well, the movie's just so generally joyous that it kind of seems a little bit incongruous with the dark idea of the uh, incest at play that sets the plot in motion. Um, and and it's also like a visual thing. Where and it's, it's also so, a musical. Yeah, it's also kind of a musical. Yeah, that's definitely something Shock to Me has been, is known for, definitely, is creating all these great musicals throughout the 60s. And this seems like less of a musical um, than those movies. It, it has musical moments and they sing songs but it doesn't really rely on musical set pieces in no, the same way no, there's but no, the music by michelle legrand is awesome though. it is yeah there's no like showstopper number but no. like it, it it's nice to have the musical so tunes in there really like this comes off as kind of just like a lyrical fantasy movie and if you're someone yeah. who's listened to the show before and you really enjoyed our episodes on stuff like the bandwagon or la belle at la Bette, this is a movie for you that you might enjoy especially la belle at la Bette, because this movie uh, is in v- many ways kind of like a love letter to La Belle at La Bette, not just with the casting of Jean Marais and actual quoting of Jean Cocteau's poetry in the movie. It it has so many like visual references and takes so many cues from that movie. And even the way it uses magic and does this, you know, reverse photography special effects. Um, and because of that, I think that's another interesting thing to sort of go into is how uh, this is a movie and a director that is often associated with the queer cinema. So that's another thing that we're going to be talking about during the commentary track. So there's a lot of really fascinating things about this movie. And it is just like visually this movie is like just an amazing buffet, just like amazing food. It's Never just laid out really. Yeah, yeah. Always something for your eyes to feast on this that's, entire film. That's really this movie's thing is like visual pleasure it's like this is just so nice to look at all the the mizzen scene yeah the props the decor it's just perfect Unab- unabashed visual just joy over- oh yeah joy overload yeah. the entire time and i'm so happy we get to watch yeah. it but before we jump in i do want to start off with a little bit of a quote to help contextualize how we might approach jacques Demy's filmmaking and this film in particular and i'm gonna recall a quote uh from our bandwagon bandwagon episode from way back uh, and this is from the book Genre the Musical, edited by Rick Altman. It's a really wonderful collection of essays. Go get it. You can find it uh, in the show notes. I'm going to be including it in the show notes for this episode. And I'm going to be quoting Thomas L. Sasser's essay, which is the essay that begins the book. And he writes uh, regarding Vincent Minnelli's musical. He says, For what seems to me to be essential for all of Minnelli's films is the fact that his characters are only superficially concerned with a quest, a desire to get somewhere in life, i.e. with any of the forms with which the dynamism rationalizes or sublimates itself. What we have instead, just beneath the surface of the plots, is the working of energy itself, is the ever-changing, fascinating movement of a basic impulse in its encounter with or victory over a given reality. The characters... Existence is justified by the incessant struggle in which they engage for a total fulfillment, for total gratification of their aesthetic needs, their desire for beauty and harmony, their demand for an identity of their lives with the reality of their dreams. So, yeah, I think that's something that we can really use as a uh, sort of landmark for launching our discussion of Jacques Demy's characters as well, because they're very much characters who you could all describe a lot of his best characters as like daydreamers, but they're chasing this sort of dream, this idea of a reality inside themselves and then trying to bring it to fruition to the Mm. world around them. And you shared that quote with me before we started recording and I kind of latched onto it as a interesting way to sort of provide a through line throughout this movie where there, I kind of felt like it was almost two separate stories at one time, but Mm -hmm. like if you look at it as two separate characters chasing the objects of their desires, yeah, throughout the film then like it it kind of brings a sense of narrative through way that was kind of lacking for my first yeah because otherwise it might seem a little bit sort of slapdash and kind of random but it when you think about it it's like yeah all these characters are sort of chasing their own desire in this own specific way and this movie is kind of a celebration of them trying to bring that desire to fruition which is the center of a lot of Jacques Demy's movies but yeah Max is there anything else to say are we ready to jump in Let's jump in. Let's do it. And back to our old friend, the Criterion Channel. <laughs> my, that, my old friend. Your something old that we've, No, we have never said anything negative that was <laughs> oh, completely really? unfounded in reality. 
about the Criterion channel um, well, like, just because we were too dumb to figure out menus. Um, I think you're taking a lot of... Uh, you, you're that you're was, no, that sharing never, a lot of responsibility for accusations that you were the uh, standard bearer. Uh, no, for. these accusations never happened. These aren't... Th- we never okay. said that they never offered subtitles on their DVDs. Yes. Um, and I've never threatened and I the never, president. And I never <laughs> said that we... <laughs> They hated hearing impaired people because that <laughs> we were too dumb to figure out how their menus worked. <laughs> that is something that literally has never happened ever. If you're working for the Criterion Collection, listening to this right now, just know that we really made a lot of use out of your wonderful products, and you should keep releasing movies, and perhaps even send some to me for free. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, Austin movie- had nothing to do with my <laughs> my personal crusade <laughs> against you that... <laughs> Turned out to be a disaster. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, the movie has started. Welcome to Podon, everyone. Or Donkey Skin, if you're yes. a red blooded American watching this movie. Yeah. As I, all red blooded Americans should. Podon has a nice poetic ring. I think I like the sound of it more. Donkey Skin kind of sounds just. I think Donkey Skin, like, and I mentioned in the intro that, like, I was kind of expecting something different. Yeah. But I think the title had something to do with that, where it's, like, kind oh. of gross and gritty and, like, Podon. Maybe it's just because it's yeah. French, but like that that kind of <laughs> if I went into it with that mindset, maybe yeah. I would be expecting something different. But. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I'm sure there's a different version of this movie where it translates as ass skin. Yes. And uh, that would be something else entirely. That's like my favorite uh, quote from the Bible. Oh, uh, Genesis 16, 12. And he shall be a wild ass of a man and he will shake his fist against the world and the world <laughs> will shake their fists against him. That is a great quote. It a is. wild ass of a man. That's great. <laughs> That's the, that's the one Bible verse I have memorized. So when <laughs> Christians start quoting the Bible at me, I can quote that back at them. When you have your badass, like, <laughs> I'm a cool guy moment in your life. Yes, when I when I have my Quentin Tarantino cool <laughs> moment, I can I can quote that one I'm thing. I'm a wild ass of a man. <laughs> <laughs> and I can just be so fucking cool and tip my fedora and oh, study the blade or whatever the fuck. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, man, this, this is not a good start to this episode. Oh, this is a wonderful start. We, we got to stop talking about uh, terrible internet things. <laughs> this movie's too wholesome for all that nonsense. Yeah, all that incest is so wholesome. Uh, Max, this movie is incredibly wholesome, despite it being about incest. It is, and a lot of that has to do with the visual flair and charm, yeah. but like, just tonally, even with the dark themes at the beginning, like, one, the movie just sort of takes like a ha-ha-ha-ha-ha approach to that. And it just turns into a wholesome fairy tale by the end. And I, I, I do like that. Yeah. But it, yet again, it's a little confusing. <laughs> well, I think part of it, too, is that the tone comes from how how thoroughly in control Jacques Demy is of the camera work. The camera work in this is, like, stealth incredible. Um, because obviously we can point to the mizzen scene and the incredible fucking outfits and the amazing decor in this movie. I mean, just look at the moment you first see them, you're like this is the most remarkable shit I've seen. Uh, just the way they design uh, the Catherine Deneuve as a queen character, um, because she plays two roles, both the queen and the daughter. Um, you see her wardrobe and her room, and it's like, this is the first shot of the movie, and I'm already blown away. Um, everything is so beautiful. Jacques Demy is a master of using a limited color palette, but also these camera moves, Max. We're going to see it, especially in these establishing sequences at the beginning, the prologue, so to speak. Um, where we're getting this narration about the king and his prosperous kingdom. We're going to see that Jacques Demy is a master of setting up shots uh, that have horizontal movement. Uh, And he's so good at using movement of the camera, uh, combining both a pan and a track movement, whether in whichever direction, in order to create a sense of like fleeting mysticism. You know, these the camera movements that he uses to establish a lot of this are just like the essence of what I would call, you know, fantasy camera movements. Everything's very <laughs> gliding and smooth and glossy. And Oh, 100 yeah. percent. I'm sorry. I was just envisioning the uh, alternate reality cinema sins version of this where they're just like, wouldn't the donkey shitting currency cause massive inflation? <laughs> <laughs> Ding. <laughs> oh, God. Let's, let's be glad. I don't even know if they're still doing that I, I don't know what cinema sins is up to but they're like probably making their own movies now yeah they made they made they were like oh we'll make our own movie and it was just like ding the worst and y- you know yeah and then they can make a cheeky video being like oh everything wrong with our own film <laughs> we're in on the joke on how bad we are oh god 
there's some internet things that are just like, you hate what you talk about. <laughs> Cinema Sins is one of those. I've never seen people so committed to hating movies and not enjoying them uh, as the people at Cinema Besides Sins. the Spectator Film Podcast. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> we hate movies even more, oh. but for the right reasons, not for <laughs> stupid true. reasons. That's true. And you were saying, like, his casting does, like... Jean Marais? Yeah, Jean Marais' casting does harken back to a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. But... La Belle, La Belle. And I know that both of the outfits are based on, like, almost, like, Louis the Fourteenth Sun King type things, but it is, like, the outfit is almost a remarkable likeness to his princely it attire. Is, so the the outfits and costumes for him do draw inspiration not only i believe it's louis the 15th whatever is this specific, there's too many fucking louis but i'm saying is you're you're pointing that out and i you're correct in in hearkening back to that because i think it is inspired by that 17th century whichever louis was in the 17th century when charles perrault wrote this story originally that's where a lot of the you know period elements of these outfits are coming from but these outfits are kind of anachronistic deliberately because they they're not trying to be strict um recreations of the past obviously this movie is not interested in that um it is also absorbing a lot of like psychedelic you know play with colors and sort of well, 60s yeah we have fashion. The, we have the blue man group fucking working <laughs> yes. as we have the, the blue kingdom and the red kingdom <laughs> yes yeah and everything's just solid colors and the queen of the red kingdom like looks eerily similar to like the queen of hearts and most <laughs> like yeah. alice in wonderland adaptations so it, a lot of the elements of the outfits have a basis in historical fact, but they definitely take a lot of creative license as well to give it that more fantastical feeling. And I know for a fact that one of the uh, deliberate points of reference was his outfit in La Belle at La Bette, which we commented during that episode about how um, sort of magisterial and kind of campy and silly that outfit seems at times. And I love it. I really do. That outfit is also great. That, that movie. movie. <gasps> oh my God, Max, it's your favorite thing. I... So I, I've said before, we d we've done them on the podcast, which is still, despite not being even close to one of the best movies we've done on the podcast, is one of my favorite movies just for what it represents. And I have said that if I could own any movie prop in my fictional warehouse where they keep every movie prop ever in after they're done making the movie. Yes, the Indiana Jones <laughs> uh, treasure warehouse. Where they keep every movie prop and then none of them are thrown away or yes. deteriorate or whatever. I would own the ants from them. Although this cat throne is giving it a strong run for its money, not going to lie. Yeah, the cat throne is really, really something, and I wonder who has that Because one, it's a tacky-ass fucking 70s cat piece of furniture. It looks like it's made out of, like, sheer carpet. Yes, and I yeah. love that. But two, like the way you have to sit on it makes you look like a sassy bitch. And <laughs> like, I love that. It's a seat that <laughs> turns you into a sassy bitch. And uh, how can you not? And we did watch a little short featurette with our frequent problematic source, Anna Villar, about her inspiration from this movie. Um, and she was sort of talking about how they have like period accurate clothing with like tacky fake gems sewn onto them. Yeah to create this sort of environment. And that cat throne is the perfect encapsulation of yes, that. Where it's the, I mean, the idea of a cat throne is fun, but then they do it in this like cheeky kind of like tacky way that makes it just look sassy. Right. And that's where a lot of the camp comes from. This is it's kind of a visual camp, you know, of these, these incongruous visual elements that are kind of blended together. And yet, even though they're incongruous, they fit together incredibly well. Um, you could only make this movie if you had a really strong sense of vision and strong coordination between your you know, your costume designer and your uh, set designer and uh, and just the director and cinematographer as well. I mean, obviously, all the paints and everything they would use, they need to, to paint them and have them be a specific color to interact with the camera in a specific way. So it, inquire, it requires a very like strong sense of control and coordination to actually do this um, and make it seem like something that's just at peace with itself and not bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, it's one of the Habsburgs. Oh God. I yes. had Austin who, who had been remained blissfully ignorant of the Habsburg jaw of our, the royalty of most yes. European nations, the inbreeding that went on in there. And well, how, I knew they were inbreeding. I just didn't know that was, that was like the most prominent. Yeah. <laughs> they how, look like Sylvester Stallone at the end of Rocky. 
but more so. Yeah. It, it looks like caricatures. And you have to remember, like, those are royal portraits to make them look as good as, as possible. As flattering as possible, yeah. Uh, what a nightmare. Um, but yeah, he's swiping left on all these portraits because they're trying to... His, his, uh, his court is trying to set him up with another uh, queen so that he can produce a male heir. And he's basically doing royal Tinder right now. Or yes. He's literally throwing all of these photos to the left on the bed. Yes, he's like, I hate all these bitches. Um, Max, I do want to go back and pick up a comment, though, that was made by his little entourage when he first said, go find me people that if you insist I, I should marry again, go find some people for me. And the comment I want to go back to is one of his uh, handlers sort of saying, like, a woman doesn't have to be virtuous and beautiful as long as she is uh, 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 fertile and can produce an heir. Right. And then, you know, obviously Jean Marais goes, I disagree. I made this promise to my now dead wife that I would marry someone only more beautiful than she is. And I take that seriously. However, I think that's interesting because this movie in that comment and I think in what we're going to see with the way it plays with the donkey skin itself, uh, it sort of sets up this dualism between utility and beauty, where there are things that are not beautiful perform like a very important function and utility, right? Producing an heir, being fertile. And then there are things that are beautiful, but do not necessarily perform a function. And they're kind of synthesized in the romance at the end with the Red Prince. However, Jean Marais' character, the king, follows the sort of impulse to uh, obey his desire for beauty beyond utility. Because if you look at why they would want to marry again, why would him marrying his own daughter provide any benefits materially? Gains no land, gains no claims or uh, resources to anything outside what he already has. He needs he needs a male heir is the argument. And but, let, letting her marry a man, which is what would probably happen, would let all of his holdings, including the gold-shitting donkey, fall into somebody oh, else's uh, hand. Max, I know. I know how Crusader Kings works, okay? I'm just saying that, like, compared to the I other... <laughs> I couldn't learn that fucking game. Are you kidding me? I don't have $800 to spend on DLC to make a game playable. Fuck anybody who plays Crusader I, Kings, I don't want to get into this. I didn't, I didn't... I was just making a stupid joke. Just let it go. Just let it happen. No, okay? I refuse. I... The reason I brought that up is because if you listen to their arguments for the other people they're offering for the king to potentially court... They're all related to material gain. See, the king, though, even though he might produce a male heir, he does not gain anything by uh, marrying his own daughter. Nothing that he already has, right? So he is sort of chasing this abstract idea of beauty uh, uh, represented by his daughter at the expense of like a material utility. Whereas we're going to see later in the end... The, the prince kind of takes a, a different approach where he does not seek beauty. He just seeks the utility of whose ever finger this ring fits, if that makes sense. So it's a little bit different. Oh, look at those Elton John disco boots. True. Can we just say that Jean Marais' performance is, is great in this movie? It's great. Yeah. I'm like, he's playing a horrible person, but like, he's absolutely radiant you don't hate him as much as you should no he's absolutely radiant whenever he's on screen yeah and i wish he was in more of this movie yeah but he's about to disappear from the movie once we finish with this uh uh dress sequence which is honestly one of my favorite sequences because i commented to this effect when the first time we watched the movie but oh, just to interrupt by the way this is the moment where uh, he's going to read the jean cocteau poetry yes from the future which if you haven't listened to our la belle at la Bette episode the reason why this is an interesting touch is because jean marais was famously and publicly in a relationship with jean cocteau for years and he played the beast or the prince in yes that yes that film um as we noted in a very similar outfit however um what the fuck was i talking about thanks austin I'm sorry. You were talking about the dress sequence. <laughs> but I was just saying, like, how much fun it would be. I mean, as I'd noted, it would be a lot of work. But, like, how much fun would this be to be the costume designer on this movie? Like, just being able to create these elaborate, fun, impractical dresses to wear for one sequence alone. It's just, I mean, all of the costumes in this are like that. Like, the period accurate clothing with 
this weird 70s psychedelic yeah, cheesy flair. Just lets you run wild. And it works so well with the Technicolor. <laughs> like, it just bounces off so well. Yeah, the costumes were done by someone named uh, Git Magrini. And they also worked on Last Tango in Paris, The Conformist, La Chinoise, uh, Red Desert, and La Clisse. Those are some of the other big movies they've done. So, yeah. Oh, they've actually worked on a ton of movies. Holy shit. They worked on Short Night of the Glass Dolls, The Wild Child, Le Grand Buffet, a number of Godard movies, 1900. They worked on The Nun, the Jacques Rivette movie. So, yeah, they've done a lot. Um, oh, I thought you were talking about The Nun, no, the, no, the no. new film. We're not even going to talk about that. Uh, I'm vetoing that comment. Um, but, Max, I, I agree. Like, And that's something that Jacques Demy is really good at doing in his other movies, too, except in his previous movies, they're all set in the modern day, right? This this movie, I think, is probably one of the bigger budget movies that he was given access to at this point in his career, as far as how much money he had to make it. Um, so this movie is kind of like the most indulgent he gets with these insane outfits at this point in his career. He's never really had an opportunity to go this crazy yet. And he takes full advantage of it. He does. Yeah. A quick bouncing off from a uh, costume done to, to set design. This is the second movie in a row that we've done that has a fun bubbly chemistry set very early on in the film. What? Secret oh, of Mr. Man. Ages. Yeah. Mr. Ages. Yeah. He also had a fun bubbly chemistry set. Although this, this man is uh, uh, Vi- sinister. <laughs> Violet Beauregard's father or whatever. Um, the blueberry. <laughs> who gives the king advice that <laughs> dating his daughter is actually a good idea. Every Everything about this man is just so sinister, where yeah. it's like, what experiments is he conducting up here? But he's, he's running he experiments. He is standing next to an owl, so... Yeah, that's cute. Um, you, you've you worked with owls before. Yes, I don't I know have. if you've mentioned that on the show. Um, You're I've, basically a bird tamer. Uh, not really, but I, I did work <laughs> at the Audubon Society for years. Um, we had two very kind barn owls, um, one very territorial great horned owl, who... Once you took him out of his cage was a sweetheart, but if you went inside his cage to like feed him or whatever, he just he fucking hated you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um barn owls, at least the ones we had in captivity, they they are very nice once they get to Do know you, you think that guy who that that weird scientist in the tower, the alchemist, we'll call him. Yeah. Do you think he, and he just commented while we were talking that if he did have a daughter, he would totally marry her? Do you think he probably treats his owls right? I don't want to think about that. I don't want to. I don't think I would trust them with anything if they said that. Uh, needless to say, that particular character is probably the most evil character of this movie. He basically had the page for like the like thing he was talking about in his research and the advice he was giving to the king. He opens this book. He had the page open to the page where it's talking about like incest with your daughter. It's like whenever you point out to like four chan trolls of just like, isn't it weird that y'all like fucking children? in anime and it's just like well actually the age of cons- consent in japan is this and they have that ready to send to you and it's like the fact that you have this ready to go so quickly means that like i, I further question we must your make motives some changes yeah <laughs> so yeah that's that's what you would look like fortune dwellers just a fat blueberry in medieval times <laughs> that's who you would be now max we're going to transition to something else right now because i don't think i've prepared you for what i'm about to say uh, which is we're about to be introduced to one of my favorite actors of all time. Really? Yes. Delphine Seyrig. I know you uh, You spoke highly of her the entire first screening we did, yeah. and her character is so much fun in this film, so I she's, can see why. But. She's a blast in this movie. She does not get a lot to do, but she she is very... She doesn't need it, though, no. honestly. And more would be great, but like, she's just so much fun in every scene she's in. And yeah. the... The camera moves along with her fun. The movie plays along with her great. It's just everything about her performance and the way it weaves into this world is fantastic. And Max, I know we've talked about this a lot. I've told you time and again, uh, and I cannot wait for you to finally watch this movie. Um, Delphine Seyre gives maybe the best vampire performance in film in Daughters of Darkness as speaking of weird incesty. <laughs> European nobles as Countess Battery. Ah, okay. Yes. Um, and her performance in that, which came out the year after this, is absolutely phenomenal. One of the best vampire movies, for sure. Um, but she's also in things like Jean Dielman, um, Chantelle Ackerman's masterpiece, and stuff like Last Year at Marion Bad. She's super important for uh, the sort of French art house cinema 
uh, sort of legacy. And at a certain point in her career, she was a stark feminist as well. At a certain point in her career, she only started working with female directors, I believe. Um, which a very interesting choice to make career wise, especially, you know, 40 years ago yeah, at this geez. point. Yeah. You could barely make that work today. Yeah. So, uh, I, there's a lot of things to admire about, uh, Delphine Seyrig and, and she's a wonderful actor. Also fun fact for everyone, Delphine Seyrig distantly related to someone we've brought up on the show before, uh, theorist and famous linguist Ferdinand Saussure. And of if course. You, if you know who that is, you're probably like, what? But yeah, so Ferdinand Saussure is apparently related to Delphine Seyrig. So speaking of familiar relations, I love how the fairy godmother, that's like a trope that's in a lot of fairy tales. Yeah. Is just sort of like the alcoholic aunt in this movie (laughs) almost. (laughs) Just like wearing these like extravagant nightgown-esque dresses and just being like, okay, come tell me your (laughs) troubles. You have to take a boat to my house and... Just come talk to me in the middle of the woods. She has a telephone. I know how to handle men. Let's just start asking them for outrageous shit and they'll dump you like they always do because men are trash. And I love it. I love that type of character for the fairy godmother. It works so well. She's great at playing a type of like gentle prodding um, without seeming condescending. You can tell that she's clearly like trying to steer uh, Catherine Deneuve into a specific direction. That, that direction being you cannot marry your father because that's just, we're not going to do that. <laughs> um, but she's very good at doing it gently and sort of speaking at Catherine Deneuve's level without um, coming, making the character seem sort of condescending. And there's perhaps reason for the character to seem condescending because we get hints that perhaps the lilac fairy, as she's called, is uh, up to her own scheme here to try to... Yeah, I was yeah. just going to bring that up where it's like, do you think it just sort of dawned on her to do this now? Because the king will mention her in a bit and sort of like a, oh, you've been talking to that fairy godmother again. Just like, yes, we and her have a bad blood between us about something that's never mentioned. But like, do you think it's that like, oh, all, (laughs) I'll set this girl up with this prince from a faraway land so that way i can fuck her father it's like, <laughs> yes. is that the goal or did that was that just like oh i guess this works the movie doesn't give you a clear answer no and uh that's part of the movie's charm and part of the movie's like confounding nature where it's like how do i feel about this i don't know <laughs> um and it it holds you in that tension where it doesn't really give you a clear answer but it's clear that like delphine sayrick's character the lilac fairy uh is gunning for marrying uh, Jean Marais. Oh, here we have the first dress. How lovely. And the first time we see pr- this particular room, which, I mean, we could say this about every scene, but like the decor is just absolutely incredible. No, yeah, but I, I love the weather effects matted onto the dress. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a fun effect, especially for the 70s. Very simple, but, you know, I mean, Catherine Deneuve is a beautiful woman and the dress is beautiful on its own. The and problem with this dress is like, it's better than all of the other dresses. Yeah, I also like this dress more than the rest. Especially better than the second one, I yeah. gotta say. The moonlight dress is <laughs> Moon dress. Yeah. N- not in this season. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Weather dress and sundress, sure. But, but you know what? Two out of three is not bad. No. Especially given how perfect all the outfits are in this movie. And also... You're allowed one week out. The, the, the in-movie tailors. They only have one day to make all of these yes. things. So we gotta cut them a break. <laughs> yes, that's the uh, plot motivation for it. Um, oh, I just noticed Delphine Seyrig's shoes for the first time. Look at that. Look at those heels. Look at those heels. This almost, and I don't know, like it almost has like a slight Pee Wee's Playhouse vibe to it. I don't know if you get that, but like, kind of where it's just like adults acting in these like insane, yeah, brightly colored things that like with themes that are clearly for adults, but like visually can be enjoyed by children. Yeah. Like I'm not saying any connection or whatever i'm just like get again vague vibes well it's it's an idea of a mode of address and we were talking about you know is this this movie clearly falls into what we might call like a fantasy movie or a musical and we were talking earlier you know like would we call this a kids movie would we call this a fantasy movie and um coming off of recording the secret of nim last week we talked about how bizarre and kind of subtly challenging it is to categorize a genre of kids movies because no other genre is so dependent upon 
the anticipated viewer. And yet this movie seems like it might be for kids, but it has like the incest stuff like right in your face, (laughs) but it does not, again, it does not treat it with the severity that you might expect of that sort of material. It and also it, the killing the donkey that you so prominently yeah. introduce if, and I know this is before the era, at least of disnified of disnified. Like, yeah. like we have to focus we test to every aspect yeah. so that no children will find this challenging or saddening or whatever. But you don't want to like prominently introduce a cute donkey at the beginning of your movie and then yep. fucking skin it as a major plot point. If your target demographic is small children, who will get emotionally invested in that donkey immediately and then cry when it's dead. So I guess the point of bringing that up is like, there's a lot of things in this movie that would might seem challenging to kids. And, uh, you know, I'm sure if I was a kid and I saw this movie, I would enjoy a lot of it in spite of that, or I might just, just not grasp the true nature of what's going on. Um, but I, I guess, I guess the final conclusion you have to arrive at is it's kind of like, I don't know. (laughs) Like maybe it would play well for kids or something, but it definitely in terms of how they're acting and the way the movie addresses the viewer, it feels like it is made to address children, even if they're not necessarily the ones watching it. Um, And again, that that's no statement about like the intelligence of what they're doing. It's just, it's a level of, it's a type of performance style and it's a type of, um, interest in the setting and the color and and the way they present the action i think but again this movie occupies a weird limbo space between those two things where you know obviously this movie can have something to offer children but uh certainly is very enjoyable for adults as well and again this was jacques demy's most financially successful movie in his career uh Yeah. This also, tr- when does this movie take place? Is something you could argue because she yeah said it's like oh my wand's running low like a battery and she's like what's a battery and it's like oh I'm yeah. getting old. Well, we we just barely mentioned it, but when we're first introduced to the lilac fairy, we see that she has a telephone. Yeah. In her little <laughs> forest hideout. Um, so there's lots of very interesting anachronisms in this movie, and we talked about how critics have also been kind of unsure of how to tackle this movie, at least English language critics, because there's more scholarship and academic writing on Jacques Demy, I think in French than there is in English. Um, But I think critics have not discussed this movie as much outside of things like the fun anachronisms. I also like, because it helps them better describe Jacques Demy's more, more critically accepted and revered other films, you know? Yeah. And also like, I don't, it's, it's a thing, fun thing to think about for two seconds, but it's like, um, oh, what's a good example? Oh, the genie in like Aladdin or something. Like okay. he'll make pop culture references. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's like for the benefit of the audience. Yeah. And like, so Robin Williams can do thing. more fun yeah. stand up. Like you don't have to be like, oh, does Aladdin take place in a post nuclear apocalypse? <laughs> Fuck you. He's making jokes because they're funny to you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy the jokes. Yeah. And that's what this movie is too, where it's really embracing a type of artificiality. But um, much like La Belle at La Bette, Although La Belle at La Bette, if we be- remember the beginning of that movie, it explicitly asks you to suspend your disbelief. This one is implicitly doing the same thing, where it's like, you look at the extravagant outfits, the insane sets, the wonderful uh, flamboyant colors, you know this is not real. And yet this movie is asking you to believe and to care and to sort of emotionally invest in what these characters are doing. And because these movies radiate so much love and care. It's quite easy to do that. That's always shocked to me's thing is, is pushing the audience towards like a very sincere level of identification with uh, most of the characters in his movies. <laughs> She's despised me ever since, since when father? No, don't mind about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The movie does not answer what the conflict between the lilac. They, fucked. Fairy, they probably did fuck. Yes. <laughs> something, something about that. Interestingly enough, that is uh, probably the majority of the movie's concern with the past and with memory, which is something that's quite a change for Jacques Demy at this point in his career, because a lot of his best movies before this, they rely on characters having a type of like past and baggage that they're bringing with them 
into the start of the movie and that they're going to work through. Ooh, got some nice bisexual lighting going on here. I don't know why. <laughs> but. Yes, Twitter's new fascination is purple and and pink lighting. It's purple, pink, and blue, yeah. Yeah, is bisexual lighting, apparently. So Daria Argento, bisexual. <laughs> oh, man. But Max... I'd, I would like Dario Argento even more if it turned out he was bisexual, but uh, I don't, I have, it's and it's like, listen, using the colors of the bisexual pride flag to annotate a bisexual character. Like I'm sure it's been done in times, but like, that's not the only reason you do it. And well, when did the bisexual flag? I didn't even know that was a thing until you just said it. Really? Yes. Oh no. It's been around for a, a while now. How, but how long? Not quite as long as the, like the as Dario ca- Argento, <laughs> no, not that long, but like because the modern yeah gay rights flag that we have, like that that was the first pride flag, and ever since then, communities that have felt that they particularly haven't been necessarily represented make their own flags. Yeah, sure. But Why not? I don't think this character he he seems rather straight. I don't think we're supposed to get bisexual vibes from him. Unfortunately, well, I, Max, I know. I don't the know. actor, yes, but the character in the film, in but, the text. Yes, but also the movie, again, very much very much a love letter to LaBelle at LaBette. And we talked about how in that episode, the sort of love, the bestial love between Beast and Belle is kind of like something that is not necessarily analogous to like a homosexual desire, but... There's a connection there. And and we also talked in that episode, something that I think applies to this movie is how the idea of magic and symbolism in Jean Cocteau's movie is something that he deliberately tries to make resistant to easy interpretation. And like he tried, Jean Cocteau would always try to thwart your ability to interpret films along some sort of clear cut schematic. And I think this movie does the same thing. And it's why people, I think, often throw their hands up in the air when they have to dig into the subtext of different parts of this movie is because it is taking that level of inspiration from Cocteau where it's saying, we're not going to yield you an easy answer about this. In fact, there is no clear answer about how this movie really feels about the incest or whatever. All you know is that it's a taboo, weird thing, you know, and that we're encouraging her not to do it. However, I have seen people compare this to La Belle at La Bette in terms of having that taboo, inclination towards romance the only difference in this is that it feels weirder because we know <laughs> that it's incest i i can see that argument yeah. also i am enjoying watching this a third time under the presumption that the fairy godmother's sole <laughs> motive <laughs> yes. is to get her out of the way so she can fuck the king um, oh yes yeah, just wear this fucking disgusting carcass on your skin <laughs> for a while and just her like, oh, well, maybe I should just go. No, you're fucking stupid. You can't do that. Now, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you agree with her. Oh, and it's... I'm going to put shit on your face. <laughs> and also wear this fucking donkey carcass, you <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be terrible for about a year and a half. I fucked him before you were even born, and this is how I got repaid. Yeah. I have to give your dumb ass advice of why not to fuck your dad. I do like that, and I know this is probably a limitation of what they had available to them, though, but also it fits stylistically with the movie, is she's supposed to appear utterly hideous, like leopard times a thousand to anybody who sees her, but the movie never even, like, gives you a shot of, like, what she looks like to regular people or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine with that, honestly. It fits with the fairy tale nature. Yeah. We never lose sight of the beautiful princess. So yeah. it's even more shocking when people are so cruel to her. But I think it's interesting you bring that up because I think it helps emphasize the fact that despite that, you still know what they're going for. And part of that has to do with the way that, um, again, to reference La Belle at La Bette, they, they use stuff like slow motion photography to help communicate like a subjective experience of time. We know that the way she looks to herself and who she is on the inside of the donkey skin is fundamentally different from the way she's perceived on the outside, partially because of the way they so effectively used like the pause time thing that actually just started right now as I'm talking about it, where, um, you know, Catherine Deneuve, what's going on right now in the movie is Catherine Deneuve, under the advice of the lilac fairy, is fleeing her father's castle uh, so that she will not have to get married to him. And she's doing so in the the skin of the donkey that was magical and produced gold. 
And now she's going to go on a magic carriage and be taken to a faraway kingdom, the Red Kingdom. And this entire sequence is rendered in beautiful uh, slow motion photography. And we'll see after she gets out of the carriage that um, she'll run through the town square and everyone's sort of like frozen uh, in time. So obviously she's not, her, her rival isn't really being perceived, really. There's something sort of magical going on here. And a scene where they should have had uh, less animals in the frame because people can act like they're standing still. Oh, Max. I know. It's let's my, just say... Let's it's, w- it's my one little, like, you could have shot this slightly differently. Let's say that it adds something to the movie. Let's say that the animals always love you so that they don't get frozen by magic the same way. They notice that you're always animals a aren't, princess. Animals aren't as put off by your... Your ugly donkey skin. Yes. Yeah. As long as you feed them, they'll love you. Yes. The other interesting thing about her arrival in the Red Kingdom, and I don't know if you picked up on this, it almost seems as if when she arrives, people are acting as if she's always been there. It almost seems like a world reset, you know, where they, they're, the moment time unfreezes, uh, people are immediately making fun of her as if she's always been the laughing stock of the town. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. To a degree, yeah. Like, it almost seems like with the woman that she's going to be cleaning for. Yes. Like, <laughs> she sent in a job application, and they're like, oh, that's you, okay. Yeah. So there's some sort of magic going on here where, like, you know, uh, they're, like her life is being, like, replaced in some ways. This is how I feel, though, whenever I make, like, a beautiful character in an RPG decked out with the coolest <laughs> thing, and then, like, I have to switch to ugly-ass gear for combat or whatever. <laughs> oh, fuck, I'm covered in donkey skin. <laughs> Don't laugh, it gives me plus 10 poison resistance. I just need to get it through this fucking swamp. Just let me get through, and I'll switch back to my cool-looking outfit. Now, Max, now that we've entered the sequence of sort of subjective time, with her running through this paused village. Uh, and I think also, I just want to say, again, if we're talking about period outfits and just set design and everything, really beautiful. You get a really great pastoral, um, rural vibe from all their outfits and, and their posing and everything. Like, it just looks like a beautiful sort of French Impressionist painting in some ways. I, I love it. But I want to bring up another quote, this time from a book by a woman named Amy Herzog called Dreams of Difference, Songs of the Same. And this book is about like musicals, but specifically the idea of the musical moment in film, the moment that people break into song and what that means ideologically in film. And she writes of Jacques Demy's movies. She talks about it in reference to a philosopher named Henry Bergson and writes, um, actually, you know what? Should I pause for this woman? This woman's so delightful. I mean, we'll get plenty of her. But... Yeah, but we only see her spit frogs out of her mouth like several times. <laughs> Only like six times throughout the movie. Oh, here's the first one. <laughs> I mean, when I, you say you got a frog in your throat, I don't think that's what you necessarily mean. I, that's just another touch of this movie being totally irreverent and silly is like, I don't, I don't know if people well, we are moved, understanding what we've we're saying. We've moved past the incest plot line. Yes. Now. <sighs> now, we're, now we're at the prince falls in love with a raggedy woman who yeah. he knows is not raggedy in his heart. S- Cinderella. Yes. Yeah. But basically, the woman that she goes to work for as a scullery maid uh, spits frogs out of her mouth for no reason. (laughs) Because she's disgusting. (laughs) Yeah, it just happens. Everybody in this town is disgusting (laughs) is something that we need to learn. Yeah. And they all still make fun of donkey skin for being disgusting, or I guess. So, um, again, uh, just to go back. This is, I mean, listen, I may be a millennial, but like, it's a pretty good sized house that you get to live in for free just all you have to do is clean some pig styes every day like <sighs> that's sad uh <laughs> just saying this is terrible this is terrible max um but you I'm, don't you don't gotta me, pay you don't gotta pay rent on it you don't gotta like pay utilities like let me finish it's, this quote. it's a central location this quote begins uh writing about henry bergson uh and henry bergson's theories of perception and time and how they play with shock to me she says, Henry Bergson's theories of perception, memory, and time fly in the face of our 
most commonplace assumptions about these processes. We presume that the perception is the processing of stimuli by our sensory organs, that memories are highly individualized neurological images stored in our brains, and that time, despite our relative perceptions of it, unfolds as a series of moments that are seemingly uh, strung together like beads on the thread of the past. According to Bergson, however, perception is a reflective interaction between the perceiver and the perceived, a reciprocal exchange that takes place in the space between them, not in the mind of the subject. The phenomenon of perception originates within the object itself. The entity that perceives the object registers or distills from it only those qualities that it finds useful. Uh, and then skipping down a bit, she quotes Berg, Berg, uh, Bergson directly saying, perception is never a mere contact of the mind with the object present, is impregnated with memory, images which complete it as they interpret it so that just goes to say something we see with her moving through slow motion it's like this moment of her sort of moving within her own perception of the world uh and and like the subjectivity of our characters is like sort of um billowing out like a cloud into the world around them and that's just the way that Jacques Demy treats objects and people moving through the world there's always this magical connection joins people together true yeah and we see it in stuff like this with these magical objects and props that she sort of summons out of her uh, with her wand here's another reference to la belle at la Bette, the uh, magic looking glass that shows you the person you love yeah i think like this it definitely has like beauty and the beast cinderella vibes it, it is very like and you can tell this was a classic fairy tale handed down through generations and had cross pollination with various different stories. Yeah. And, and I think that's just also like a uh, Charles Perrault thing as well, where he wrote a lot of those different stories and um, obviously you're going to get some similarities. And here we're going to say goodbye to Jean Marais until, until the, the end of the film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> goodbye, Jean Marais. Come back again soon. Preferably in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not going to be disappointed. No, not at all. Oh, my God. That just, like, that was my, like, what the fuck? <laughs> yes, that, that sent you. <laughs> See, Max, the first words they say after they unpause is, she's dirty, she's filthy, she stinks, she's a donkey. Just the kids making fun of her. Here we get to the part of the movie with the most chickens per shot of probably any movie ever. There's so many chickens all the time. If you're a fan of chickens, you're going to really enjoy it. <laughs> Yo, chicken lovers, shout out. There's a peacock in this village for some reason. There's peacocks everywhere in this movie. <laughs> I know. All over the place. I get it in the palace or whatnot where like we have macaws and doves and swans everywhere, but in the middle of filth town, USA. Where are peacocks from? I don't know. The zoo. Are I'm not from, entirely sure. Are they from Greece? Where the fuck are they from? I don't know originally, actually. Yeah. Peacocks are the perfect animal for Jacques Demy's style of filmmaking, though. Especially in this movie. They're just so extra. There's so much going on with them. And the visual splendor of them is its own end. That's something that I, I don't think we finished talking about earlier, but I it was a point that you brought up that I thought was really good, where we're talking about how much this movie just luxuriates in the visual splendor of what's going on, and it's kind of like... Yeah, that is the point of this movie. This movie is about taking like a visual pleasure in everything that's happening, uh, whether you're a kid or an adult. And you don't have to, you don't have to be any age to learn to find something really beautiful and, and, and pretty and engaging only on a visual level, you know? And I think that's part of why this movie feels like it's approachable for all ages despite its content is because it places mostly a lot of emphasis on the visuals and keeping you interested in that way. And it's just very bright and colorful. And it maintains, uh, a, while it's doing that, a very upbeat and sort of charming tone. <laughs> yes, Podon wants to see the prince ride by, and they're like, no, you're ugly, we have to hide you. Now, Max, if you had to wear an animal skin, 
what would you, what would you be? Would you would what you would be, I be? Yeah, what would you I'd be, be somebody who wears an animal skin? Well, would you be a donkey skin? What would you be? Would you be a um a moose skin? If I'm if I'm like getting over the moral quandaries, another peacock, two peacocks, the same frame. Yeah. All the peacocks in France worked in this movie. All three of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. Okay, if we're like setting aside like moral quandaries or whatever. Yeah. Um this is just a stupid yeah, question. Just a, just yeah. aesthetic. Yeah. Um just aesthetic wise, I would want to go like maybe like Lynx or Snow Leopard or something like that. Okay, so you'd be a snow leopard skin. Yeah. Cheetah skin. Something like that. Cheetah Cheetah seems like it would fit in, in this tacky ass world. I, you have to wear it the way she's wearing it. Yeah. With its head up like on top of your head. I'm just trying to think of what aesthetically would fit in well with this world. You know what this moment reminds me of? She bumps into them, saves them from a thing, or they save her, and she goes, Misa owe you a life debt. You need to stop. <laughs> I was going to say that like all of the red people and blue people remind me of fucking Oompa Loompas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this scene is so charming. I love the way these cute people dance with their little ditty dance. They are cute. Yeah. Everybody's too attractive to be in a fucking <laughs> peasant <laughs> That's village. True. That's true. Their makeup's all nice and their skin is clear. Yeah. Everyone's really hot in this movie. Nobody's fucking dying of dysentery. What kind of movie is this? Well, Max, we don't know that they're not dying of dysentery in the background. <laughs> That's true. And I, I say that about every movie. <laughs> Secret of Nim. Everything is a crossover with the Invisible Man. Every movie. You just don't know he's in there. <laughs> That's the kind of argument. <laughs> oh, man. What movie would be the most funny crossover with the Invisible Man? We Taken. Three men and a baby. Two men. Three and men and a baby. Yeah, it's three men and a baby. Three men and an invisible baby. <laughs> it's there the whole time. <laughs> okay, that guy's really half-assing the dance. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> now, Max, look at this. Okay, look at this. Look at the edges of the plants. I was watching this earlier. Even though we are watching the very fancy and beautiful Criterion remaster, it almost looks as if it's not quite ready to have the level of digital information <laughs> to, to cover the contrast of the green with how red this prince's outfit is. Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah, there's the blurring. Because the sides. It, it, the colors are so saturated in this movie. And I love that. Yeah. Saturated colors are some of my favorite things, yeah. especially the way Technicolor like renders them. It's so nice. And and we want to emphasize that this movie is not. This movie's beautiful. Oh, here we have another uh, Jean Cocteau reference with the mouth and the flower. Um, but not done in a nice way that forwards the plot, not in a Phantom of the Opera, I've seen a good movie. Yes. <laughs> so don't judge me for this movie being yeah. bad type of way. But the reason I brought up the color stuff is just because, like, if you ever, if we ever get out of COVID and you have an opportunity to see this movie. <laughs> 20 years when we finally get the vaccine. If you see this movie in the theater, you're probably going to have a whole new appreciation for these incredibly beautiful elements than you would at on home video. And there, it looks amazing on home video. That's, so. that's an article I was just reading, actually. What? Um, is that they're starting to rent out theaters to anybody who will just like pay money to... Are you serious? Yeah. Should we do an episode in a movie theater? How much do you think that would cost? I don't know. They're doing that for gamers now so that like they can hold... In movie theaters? Yeah, they can like hold tournaments or whatnot on the oh, big screen. Jesus. Wait, isn't the point of not having people together? Why would they have a tournament? No, but I'm saying like that's services they're offer going to be offering now in order to, to like keep the lights on in a lot of movie theaters. <laughs> it's just like fucking take the th things. None of the movies are ready and we have all these fucking gigantic empty spaces. So, okay. Well, listeners, let us know if we should rent out a movie theater for no reason, I guess. And then be ask them like, Hey, do you have any like power plugs? Well, yeah, <laughs> we get in with a bunch of equipment. Do you have like an 80 extension cords? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, here we get the moment, the big moment. The prince is going to see Podon for the first time, but he's going to see her in her beautiful princess outfit, not not in her terrible donkey skin. I love how she like keeps all of this <laughs> like finery in there, but she like still leaves all the live animals <laughs> in yes. her shack. Yeah. I think it's another sort of like 
Bell at Labette touch, you know, where there's a little bit of like that surrealist um, uh, contrast. Oh, no, I'd be surprised if there was any realism in this movie, yeah. honestly. And I love that, especially at this point. But I love this moment, too, because what do we notice with the mirror? Ah, she set this up. Right? Don't you get that Im- impression? She knows that he was going to be there. That's why she's dressed up. And Maybe, yeah. And I, I get the impression that she's like constructed his position in that moment as the foyer uh, to enable his visual pleasure um, to entice him. I, I get from that moment that she has kind of learned her own lesson from the lilac fairy in the ways of manipulating men. Right? And she's like, I want to get the handsome prince to like me. So I'm going to have him walk down here. Ch- enchant a little little rose to get him to come down here. And then I'm just going to act like I don't see him. And see, I'm I be- thought the rose was the fairy godmother trying to be like... I mean, that's what I thought at first too. But when you think about it... The fairy, like- we, we don't know. The fairy godmother could have been like, yo, okay, so I know that this life that I'm having you live is shit. But trust me, I have a plan right now. See, the thing is, the fairy godmother gives her the wand. Yeah. So she does have access to, oh God, spinning frogs again. <laughs> she, she does have access to a certain type of magic. <laughs> what a lovely name. First name donkey, last name skin. Is that true in France? Is, is Poe donkey or is Poe skin? I have no idea. French listeners. Hit me up, please. We've insulted you so much. But <laughs> I if haven't. You're still listening. <laughs> I I love the French. Renowned for their excellence. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the French. Champagne, known for its excellence. There's a California champagne, also known for its excellence. No, released by Paul. It's not from the Champagne region of France. It's just sparkling. <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck are you talking about, sire? Can you imagine having to be like a royal assistant back then and just like having to like make any sense of the incestuous babble that comes out of these fucking inbred <laughs> monstrosities mouths and make that into policy? Like, uh, you want me to make a movie called Verotica? <laughs> what are you insane? Yeah, you incestuous if, count? Imagine if Danzig was the head of a country. Like, what a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> as somebody who loves the misfits like <laughs> uh. oh god <laughs> that's just too funny erotica feels like a movie that's like i don't know it's what what i imagine people who like i don't know i'm not even gonna get into it but like, <laughs> that's the problem it, is- it's what like i imagine people who have never seen a horror movie like think like some like certain horror movies are it's just like who've ever seen any movie yeah there's like police procedural elements there's like you know femme fatale like art house kind of like uh eyes without a face things in there yes but without understanding anything about it it's like glenn danzig heard someone describe these things to him while he was drunk (laughs) and then just decided to make a movie based on what he heard And we know he's seen a horror movie before because all of his fucking songs are about them, we don't so. know he's seen a horror movie we know that he's read like posters of horror movies songs like return of the fly he's just naming the actors in the movie i mean be <laughs> them their song about that it does seem like he's just reading like the pull lines off yeah. the posters yeah exactly i don't think you have to see the movies to write those songs about them so, Max, I don't know. I think the jury's still out on whether or not Glenn Danzig has been confirmed to have ever seen any movie in his <laughs> life, much less a horror movie. Veronica is not a good case for that. <laughs> we know he's been to a strip club because he's very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> but... Maybe if they had movies on in the strip club, he would. He, he would saw it out of the corner of his eye. Yeah. The very, very corner of his eye because he's not looking there. Yes, but we've we've come to the Red Kingdom. Yes, finally. Getting out of the Glenn, Glenn Danzig conversation into the Red Kingdom. Uh, now, Max, let me ask you. Do you notice many um, sort of contrasting visual styles here between the Red Castle and the Blue Castle? Uh, yeah, honestly. The, the Red Castle, although I find the contrast of the red against the white and just like 
the dyed red horses looked better than the dyed blue horses, in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, the the red castle is much less interesting. There's there's not like ivy and items like everywhere. Yeah, I don't know if we mentioned it. The blue castle, one of the defining sort of uh, design characteristics of it, is how there's this intrusion of ivy on almost every wall, and there's plant life growing all over the place on the inside of the castle. Um, so it looks like it's the castle has uh, this own sort of like my organic favorite, energy. my personal favorite dress in the movie. I, oh, the the queen and diamonds. Yes, I love it. It looks so great. I definitely think she has the best outfit of the uh, red royal family. Well, yeah. I the mean, prince looks like a fucking loser. Um, the prince looks like a, he would be a bard or something. Like, just give him a loot and just have him prance around or something. His sleeves are too big. I mean, no such thing, but also. Look at those sleeves. I am afraid they're going to catch on fire in this <laughs> scene. But. Um, I actually kind of like the king's getup because the king just is like. He looks like he's just there for the ride. He like doesn't care about anything. Somebody clearly put flowers in his beard. Uh, he just seems like he's having a ball, honestly. I mean, let's be real. Clearly, the the queen is the one that's like keeping this castle together. <laughs> the king is falling asleep during meetings. Doesn't care about anything. He should have retired during the last administration, but he was too proud to. And now it's going to fuck everything up. But oh my god! <laughs> but I, I wanna, but she does deflect the political question. She's just like the prince is like, oh, we still have maids living, scullery maids living in shacks, and he's she's just like, oh, take that up with your father. Yeah. So, well, that's the other you know difference between the red kingdom and the blue kingdom is there's a little bit of a different approach to like the idea of how people interact with the uh, the civilians, I guess. Um, we don't see any of the civilians of the blue kingdom. Yeah. We just see yeah. the agents of the king for all we know. That's, <laughs> that's the entire fucking citizenry of the blue kingdom. Yeah. You have an entire economy based on this donkey shitting. There's no other wealth. To well, go I'm, I'm glad you got back to the donkey shitting because I think I just want to elaborate on that sort of like dualism between beauty and, and like Filth. utility, <laughs> I guess where it's like the donkey is not the beautiful animal. Right. And yet it's the thing that's like it's like a metaphor almost for like a beast of burden and like capitalist production in some ways. Right. It could be. Yeah. And interestingly enough, you have the princess who has to don the skin of like a working class person yes. in order to blend in. Yes. And the source of all of his wealth. She asked him to kill it. Maybe that's why we don't see any citizens. Ho, 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 oh. ho, ho. But I mean, it is interesting that like you know, the movie forces her into a position where she becomes like a hard manual laborer and, and it treats the skin and the dress that she's wearing in within that position as something that very literally is responsible for ge having generated wealth. Right. And there's other like interesting lines where there's like wordplay about like, you know, she arrives at the old woman to get her job. And the old woman's like, why are you filthy? And she's like, well, I wouldn't be a scullery maid if I wasn't filthy. So there's little wordplay like that. But it's like this idea of associating the, the labor with this idea of filth and uh, different ideas of beauty that are like the antithesis of something that would generate wealth, which is interesting. I'm not quite sure what the movie is saying about all of that. But, but it's an inference you could make. Yeah. And it's an interesting lens on which to view this movie. Yeah. And I feel like it's something critics have not discussed as much. Um, I, I think critics do not view Jacques Demy as a very political filmmaker. I, especially in comparison to the other filmmakers of, the, of his generation within the French New Wave. Um, obviously, he's not really a political filmmaker in comparison to people like Jean-Luc Godard. Um, but he, he sort of like a satellite figure of the French new wave in some ways, despite having a lot of stylistic tendencies that he shares with them, especially in his earlier films. Um, he's sort of like wavering on the edge of that. And by this point in his career, he uh, definitely was embracing sort of a different style, his own style compared to the French new wave. Um, because, you know, the French new wave was so much about like cinema verite and like truth and, and politics and everything. And, Jacques Demy decided to make movies that very much could be dismissed as like pure escapism. And he really embraced a sense of artificiality and a lack 
of like ironic cool distance. His thing was all about sincerity and really embracing these different hmm. types of stories. And I do want to go back um, because I, I just real quick, you said, what do I think of the Red Kingdom's castle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The majority of the castle is much more boring, but I think that's because the majority of the scenes are spent in the prince's bedroom and you could tell they spent a lot of time like making the sure, bed. Yeah, the, <laughs> making sure the bed is visually interesting to look at. We're, to the point where the bed is almost psychotic. <laughs> we, yeah. We joked that there's this weird ass statue and it, we were like, what is the point of this statue right by his bed? And we were thinking, is that like his sleep paralysis demon? Oh, or yeah. the terrifying boy that stands <laughs> yes. next to his bed and has yes. never commented on. Yes, uh, or or is this movie like a backdoor prequel to the boy? It's like it's like when you go to your grandparents' house and they have like creepy dolls like that. And it's like, what purpose does this serve? D- did your grandparents have that? Because uh, one of mine did. Really? Yeah. Well, it wasn't so much dolls. It was like uh religious idols uh so like weird thing like just kind of weird looking sculptures of like jesus and mary and then they kind of yeah. upset me as a no kid. my grandparents didn't have anything creepy they had a raggedy Ann doll that always sat in the same chair oh. but i know that's the original w- annabelle or whatever but. were you about to say wanda uh, no i was just going uh, blah, 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 blah. i couldn't think of the name of the fucking doll annabelle that's definitely haunted. you know we listeners if you haven't listened to this show before we kind of live near annabelle and I have to say, I I would never, ever spend money to go see it. <laughs> Despite how fun it would be to, like, get a picture with the Annabelle doll, I just could never. Bring could yourself never. to spend actual currency. Yeah, because the tours, are I think, are, like, 25 to $30. And it's like, you know, I can't. I'm sorry. Isn't that in Zach Baggins' Baggins of Palooza or whatever. It's no, it's in it's in their uh, like little house. Museum. I know. I thought he bought a bunch of shit from them though. Oh, I don't know. Maybe maybe he bought it. Re- maybe they uh, had to sell some of it in these COVID hard times. <laughs> there we go. But Annabelle is the big find there. Not, they wouldn't sell the Golden Goose, Max. <laughs> they wouldn't skin the gold shitting donkey. <laughs> yes, the Annabelle gold shitting donkey. But I feel like if you like Annabelle from those movies, you'd be like disappointed when you find out it's just an old raggedy end doll in a glass display case with like a note that's like, please don't open haunted written on it. Or maybe they take it so seriously that they're like, that makes it more scary. That it's not a creepy porcelain doll that looks like it belongs in a horror movie. Listeners, you may be able to absorb from our conversation right now that neither Max nor myself give particularly strong credence to what you might call the supernatural. Uh, particularly out of the mouths of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Oh, can we stop? I said there was no blockbuster musical in this, but this is my favorite musical This number. is probably one of the biggest like set piece musical numbers. It's fun. Is this your favorite piece of music? It's my favorite song that is sung in the movie. Yeah. Background music, there's a lot of fun things and return to different themes throughout the entire film. But if I have to go with like an independent individual song then this by far is the most fun musical number in the film yeah it's it's very simple it's just podon she does this sort of magical trick where she duplicates herself or she kind of you know what she does max she's wearing her donkey skin reading the directions to bake this cake for the prince and she animates her dress yes to help her cook so there's like two of her um and max i also enjoy this song because i feel like this song has a lot of sexual innuendo in the uh in the lyrics, in 20 Days Later, a chick is bound to appear when you're well, baking this cake. Well, because there's a line about, like, you know, lighting up the prince's oven or whatever. <laughs> That's a way to look at it. Yeah. This movie hasn't been horny for a while, so might as well get back into it. <laughs> yeah. But again, I think that's an interesting thing about this movie and why this movie feels some... Um, so loving and friendly is because it give it cares a lot about like character desire, even if it's veiled sexual desire. And it's it's clever in its representation of it by, you know, bringing this out into like just the baking of a cake. Yeah, and well, it's funny because you have the, their literal desire song later on, but none of it is even romantic. <laughs> almost, it's like we'll roll through a field and eat cake and smoke a pipe together. There's a line where she's like, we'll go to the snack bar. Yeah. Like, well, simpler time, I guess. <laughs> but no, this, I agree. This song is great. And it's just fun to see her like wearing the cool outfits, doing 
you yeah, know, as we things. said, the costume design in yeah. this movie is a star of its own, and yeah, to see the outfits and and I don't think we, we haven't really talked much about Catherine Deneuve herself. Have you seen her in many other movies, Max? I cannot say I have, but one, you know, I'm also terrible with actors. Yeah, that, so like I could have seen her in eighty films, and then um, she's she's great. She's a fantastic actor. This was early in her career, but by this point in time, she'd already been in a number of really fantastic movies, including multiple other Jacques Demy movies. Uh, prior to this, she was in uh, The Umbrellas of Cherbourg and The Young Girls of Rochefort. Um, but also at this point in her career, she's coming off of uh, a lot of work with uh, Louise Bunuel, uh, most notably Belle de Jour, probably the best of her collaborations with him. And that movie's absolutely phenomenal. I think the same year as this movie, she also came out with Tristiana. Um, but also she had worked with Roman Polanski previous to this. Uh, yeah, so she was she was doing a lot of really like high art house credibility projects at this point in her career, and um, she had really become a star in Europe. And uh, you know, I, I think I think she's great. Uh, I she's not like my favorite French actor from this period, but um, she definitely has a very strong sense of like charisma that she carries herself with. Even as she's playing a character who, you know, is very naive and innocent in a lot of ways. Uh, she has agency, though. Yeah. She knows what she wants, and she's doing everything in her yeah. power to get it. And I feel like she plays that shift very well, where she seems kind of like... She seems kind of naive and innocent, perhaps, at the, at the beginning when she's, you know, very Maybe much... Maybe I should marry my dad. Yeah. And but, we're like, no, you should not. But then by this point in the movie, we see that she's, I think, again able to lure the prince to see her and entice the prince. And now she's cre like, I feel like this situation is something she's brought about of her own doing, you know? And she knows that this is the situation she wanted. So she could bake this love cake for the prince so that she can get the ring to him. And yep. yeah, but now we have the uh, red kingdom version of the blueberry, the cranberry, um, <laughs> the, the leader of the medical doctors, the pilgrims. <laughs> The fu they're they're fucking Dutch, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They look like the fucking like stot holder or whatever. Yes, there's red Dutch people in this movie now. <laughs> oh god. The Dutch are like one of my weirdest, like I'm not gonna go off on a huge <laughs> what? thing. What? No, but like one of your weirdest what now? One of my like historical like fast like the the lightning fast rise and fall of like Dutch control over the majority of the world. Like they just won at capitalism to the point where it's just like, okay, we don't need to do anything for the rest of our existence. <laughs> what are they doing now? And I wonder if we have any Dutch listeners. I don't know. The Netherlands like survives almost entirely off like tourism and just like hanging out now. Like they carved their inside entire city out of like cliff sides and it's <laughs> made of marble. But no economy, just vibes. They basically, <laughs> There is an old English saying that's like one of my favorite historical things, which is uh, God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands because it was just like a series of cliffs before they agricultured the shit out of it and yeah. made it into a livable country. And yeah, you have you have places like Amsterdam where you just legalize everything and let tourists flow in because of that. So, also, I know you shared this opinion, but we both have this weird addiction to cities with lots of canals. Yes, uh, that's just so awesome, and we have none in America, and it's terrible. It's a disgusting disgrace. Well, yeah, because we're worried that all of our cities in low lying water areas are going to be flooded. oh they'll be underwater in soon. like five years. Don't yeah. worry about it. You know what? We'll get canals in New York. How about that? Max, would you live in an apartment that is literally underwater if you had to go up several stories to get out? Sure. Why not? <laughs> you ask these questions. <laughs> I, I, I'm just imagining a future where it's like, yeah, property's really cheap when it's underwater. It's like, what if I actually rented an apartment underwater? Who knows? Maybe it'll happen. Who knows? I mean, that's that classic online thing where it's like the ben shapiro argument where you can you can sell your uh properties once the water level rises you think those people aren't just gonna sell their homes and move I'm the classic response of sell you, their ben. homes to who ben fucking aquaman but max we're going into the wonderful sequence that lots of people seem to enjoy remember from this movie where the the prince they're doing like an astral projection thing Uh, where both Podon and the prince 
are joined in this astral projection and together in this sort of dream world, they're like fantasizing about all the amazing romantic things they're going to do together. And I got to say, Max, maybe it doesn't seem like the most obviously romantic stuff, but I would say if this was a date, this would be like a A plus level date. Maybe we're just been (laughs) been inside from COVID for too long, but going to the snack bar, eating lots of cake, pretty good smoking out of the same pipe. Yeah. That boat ride alone. Yeah. They're smoking on a boat with like really awesome tiki torches. I bet that's just, like, really cool. No. Yeah, any any fun outdoor excursion with another person sounds like the perfect date right now. So. Yeah. Well, Max, you got to bake them a cake and then do an astral projection thing. That is one thing I have started doing a lot more since COVID. I have baked a shit ton of stuff since COVID started. <laughs> that's just the hobby we're doing now. It is nice. It's like, I, I feel like I'm getting nothing done because of COVID. And it's just like, well, I made banana bread, so fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I can make, I can get stuff done. But Max, we're talking about how romantic and, and sort of like fantastical this sequence is. But I also think this is where part of the melancholy of this movie starts to seep in, where it's like, they're not literally together right now. It is kind of like an astral no, projection. No, it's, it's them. And if we want to peel back the entire surrealist wallpaper and look at what's one under what's underneath theoretically right now it's just them fantasizing individually from each other being like i don't know if that's true i do think there's like a mind communion going on well yeah i'm saying if you want to pull off any fantastical element oh from sure it whatsoever it's just like oh she she slipped the ring to him in this cake and now they're both being like oh we have a future together because we have we have a way for us to be together now but yeah it is sort of fantastical uh, we get some weird alice in wonderland vibes here too the midsummer vibes i mean i get midsummer vibes the entire time because she's wearing like the animal carcass around her (laughs) uh i don't i don't have the heart to do midsummer with (laughs) you on this podcast i've told you i i don't think midsummer is terrible i know i actually like it more than hereditary i know we we're definitely not doing hereditary on the podcast (laughs) i do not have the energy to argue with you for the entirety (laughs) of a movie well we're going to be agreeing about a lot of things though is the problem we'd be agreeing about a lot of different individual elements that are very well done and good but we'd be disagreeing about how they work together look at that boat though look at that fucking boat we can both agree on this boat yeah that boat's fucking great Imagine that. You don't have to, like, worry about paddling the boat or anything. You just, like, fucking sit in this cool bed boat. It's just like, eh, now it's going to go down the thing. Got fire. You got pot to smoke with your person. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's pot because they, the immediately after he says we can smoke a pipe in secret, she goes, and then we can gorge ourselves on cake. Yeah. So I'm assuming. I'm assuming they got some munchies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and also, this was the 70s. So, yeah. Y- y'all smoking protest in vietnam i do think that th- that's p- again part of the way in which you might view this movie as kind of like anti-bourgeois in its sentiments where it, i don't it, know the movie's very bougie it is but it's it's about this idea of like escaping a patriarchal oppressive force you know and an older generation it is, it is kind of like the non-specific boomer like type thing of just like let's escape all of these evil pressures and just go back to love man yeah not specific solutions or anything just you know like fucking love marriage immediately (laughs) their throne is good too (laughs) <laughs> their throne is nice. I like their throne. There's no bad props in this movie. No, honestly, I said the lion throne is great, but like it's honestly that's probably worth discussing in its own right. Just the the frequency with which the props are perhaps the most conspicuous thing in the frame, and yet none of them appear bad. It's actually quite challenging to do. You think when you're paying so much attention to these outlandish props you'd notice more that are not meeting the high standard they've set. But they re- there's really very few that don't live up to uh, no, these outland- what you expect. The more outlandish they are, the better they are. The more, like, they make you question everything and make it feel like a surrealist 
like fever dream and I love it. Yeah. But again, it's, it's this weird like limbo ground where it also does not feel outlandish at all. Yeah. It all feels like of a piece. And I think probably there was a lot of work that went into coordinating uh, different styles and different types of props and different colors to different locations to get that really strong sense of place that's grounded in a lot of this stuff. Cause otherwise it would, this movie would be like, the castles would be like the inside of like the evil castle and spy kids. Do you remember that? Yeah, of course. Where the evil like Oompa Loompa people are like the Cenobites the exploding thumb thumbs. everywhere. Yes. It'd be chaos. It'd be a nightmare. That's one of our great lost episodes. And by great, I mean terrible and we'll never see the light of day. We tried to do spy kids at one point and then just determined. We never did spy kids. We thought about doing We it. prepared to do yeah. spy kids at one point and then we never recorded. But we still would like to do Spy Kids because I think we both find that movie interesting. One of the few movies that's it's coming back, I think. Robert Rodriguez said he's doing something with it. Oh, man, it's time. It's time to get back on the Spy Kids bus. I mean, but I think We Could Be Heroes or whatever did fucking terribly. So what? What's that? That was like the Shark Boy and Lava Girl reboot. Um, so Did he make that? I believe so. He The last movie he made was Alita ba- Battle Angel, I thought. Oh, so he's just on a downward spot. He might've just produced, we could be heroes or something like that, but I don't know. Oh, I heard nothing but bad things about that, which I don't know what I was expecting from the shark boy and lava girl reboot, but maybe something better than that. (laughs) Well, is it still made by kids? Cause that's the interesting thing about spy kids and, and shark boy and lava girls that they, he basically had his kids come up with the concept and script and like didn't really change it that much. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the snake oil wizard. Oh, man, Max, this is representation for you and I. This is us. The snake oil wizard. Yes. Come here, Listen ladies. to our podcast. We have meaningful things to say about film. Trust us. It'll make your fingers skinny. Come on, ladies. Step right up. You can pay us in Dogecoin. <laughs> Bitcoin only. <laughs> Wenches, please line up on the left. Also, here we get another moment of like the bizarrely uh, dark sense of humor this movie has where these women are like maiming themselves. Yeah. There's a comment that one of them is going to make in a second where she's like, this acid that we dipped our finger to- into to make our finger skinny is is melting my skin to the bone. serves you right you fucking idiots <laughs> <laughs> i also really enjoy this song this song's fun and i love how he didn't just sell them like dyed water he specifically sold <laughs> something <them>. terrible <laughs> finger enlarging <laughs> thing or whatever yeah just like as an extra fuck you <laughs> oh this this girl's gonna cut her finger this one yeah yeah what's the problem esther oh she's got a knife in her hand oh i cut my finger off (laughs) but as we discussed all the people in this movie are like the hottest people ever so clearly not too much trouble you can marry your local hay mover or whatever (laughs) these people do and they'll be just as hot as the prince yes they're not wearing a frilly big sleeved outfit yeah everyone is like from the cover of like a harlequin romance novel yeah, basically. <laughs> this is the world we'd live in if we had access to healthcare. <laughs> Every time I see the Red Guards, I just expect oompa, oompa, <laughs> oompa You know what I partially expect is like the Flying Monkey Army. Yeah. There are, there are major Wizard of Oz vibes as well. Yeah, in a good way. Yeah, I, I, none of these things are bad. <laughs> Whenever I say this movie gives me vibes, it's only from things I like, which is good. Does this movie give you bad vibes in any way? Are there things that we don't like about this movie? We've talked about things that we're like kind of unsettled on and we're like not sure how to take it, but I don't know if that's the same thing as bad. And this is a good time to bring that up because this is just sort of one long sequence to get to the point that they end up together. Yeah. But I I do want to talk about... I, I mentioned earlier my problems with the structure and... This whole sequence does lend that where if this this movie escalates very quickly and for the rest of the film, it struggles, in my opinion, to live up to that level of conflict that it builds and that level of excitement it builds. 
and it just sort of peters out from there. It ends on an explosive note, but if I had to complain, I would say it is uneven in a lot of places, at least yeah, narrative wise. I think I would agree with that too, especially in in a sense of like the stakes, because it is just such a jolly and joyous movie that you're yeah. like, I don't think she's in danger of incest anymore. <laughs> yeah, like what are the stakes at this point? We just believe that we know it's going to end well. Yeah, or, yeah. There's an inevitability of everything that's going on. And we on. see the prince being sweet because he's just like, okay. That's grooming, Max. Yeah. Hashtag cancel the prince. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I'm trying to think if I can be a cynical asshole and hate this anymore. Um, I don't know. There's not a... I, again, I'm not going to say that this movie is in his upper tier, but there's it's hard to you know, nitpick anything about this movie. Cause even though you, you might argue that it kind of loses steam a little bit, it re remains something that feels like a cohesive vision. Like, I don't think he made, I, I think he made the movie he wanted to make definitively, you know? And I, I don't think it fails in reference to what he was aiming for. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Oldie. <laughs> I love this scene because it gives all these extras like a really great moment. And how they approach the prince to get their their ring test their finger tested, all of the extras give it a little something, and it's it's just a lot of fun. But again, this is a uh, sort of the opposite process of you know finding a match that uh, the king went through. Where again, in st the woman's looks has no bearing on his choice, right? Well, he only saw a glimpse of her through yeah. the window and then through a broken, <laughs> clouded window. Yeah. So all he knows is that the ring must fit her finger. So again, he's going through like a sense of utility and function more than like aestheticization. I feel like this entire segment is just like, what well, I mean, narrative wise, it's meant to show the monotony of this, but like. Like, I, I think it was more just like. Yeah, let's give the extras a little bit time to shine, but also the costume department made all of these fucking extravagant dresses, and goddamn if we're not going to show them off in this scene. Yeah. Which, good for them. They should. And I think it's like, this movie puts a lot of emphasis on going through, I don't want to say going through the motions, but like, um, giving you all the fantasy stuff, where it's like, you see certain things in fantasy movies with... um. Like the dresses, for instance, where it's like, oh, we have to go through the three dresses, right? And we yeah. have to do the three of them first before we get to the donkey skin carcass. We can't do two. We have to do three. And with this one, it's like, oh, we have to go through every woman in the kingdom till donkey skin is the last Miss one. Miss Salt and Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the comedy they're supposed to be getting out of this is, but I do know that the next girl who tries on the ring is probably the one that I would have a crush on of all of them. Miss Glumcakes, no occupation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she has no job. Her name is Miss Glumcakes, and she's just like a forest babe. Look at her. She's humble. She's sweet. You want a forest witch girlfriend? Max, everyone wants a forest witch girlfriend. <laughs> it's the new aesthetic. She's the closest one to having the ring fit on, and then she's like, fuck it, I'm leaving. He, she was meant for a different prince because, like, that humble, like, we shouldn't even try it. Yeah. No, but we have to. She, she runs off into a different fairy tale where she, she gets married just yes. fine. Yes. She goes to the Green Kingdom. and <laughs> Yes. Yes. She was the one who cursed that lady to start spitting up frogs. Oh. <laughs> Well, we tried all the girls. Let's try the boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's why you could get me reinvested in this movie. <laughs> well, I suppose we have to try the men now. That would be a funny twist if they repeat it again before trying donkey skin. They yeah. try the men. That would be hilarious. They start blasting YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's only for uh, people who lose their presidential campaigns and don't know how to leave. This blast YMCA as you're leaving. What? You did not see that? Did when, Donald Trump do this? Yes. He was blasting YMCA as he left the White House? Well, no. It's like concession concession speech or whatever. And he was just like... Oh, yeah. He, he booked it at like a... At a store, right? No, not even that. But like he just like... As he was leaving, he was just like... Uh, 
fuck you, I'm out, and YMCA was playing because <laughs> he walked toward his fucking helicopter. <laughs> Oh. He like he hired a fucking wedding DJ to, <laughs> <laughs> to score that because <laughs> he only had twenty dollars left or whatever. I hope he dies. <laughs> I mean, don't we all? He's not the president anymore, so we can say that. <laughs> I you can say anyone you hope they die. Yeah, true. Yeah, I've learned that lesson. Oh, Max, a beautiful shot. She's been revealed, Catherine Deneuve. Yes. Oh, and we get this sort of very surreal moment where it's like, oh, we're all happy now. Yeah, you get the kind of, I don't want to call it a seamless transition, but we do the um, sort of, it, it's sort of like a jump cut to match what you would expect as they're walking towards the king and queen, but now it's on their wedding day. Yes, and, and this, again, they're in this heavenly are, attire and yeah, setting. Beautiful outfits, and, and we're about to get what I felt was maybe your favorite moment of the movie. Oh, I, I literally stood up and screamed when this happened. Yeah. I, I, I was not expecting you to freak out when you saw this. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> maybe Cause I was lulled into this sort of like stereotypical fairy tale thing. By this point, you forget about the fucking battery joke in the telephone by this yes, point in the and movie. Then you're like, they're arriving in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> But my favorite detail about this is when the helicopter lands, you see the painting of his cat throne yes. on it. <laughs> it's the symbol of his entire kingdom. Just to let you know, I'm the guy who has that cat throne. Well, without the shitting donkey, that's all he has left. <laughs> yeah. It's all the power he can muster is the fact that he has that cool ass cat throne. This is what, and I love that the like health. That's what Bitcoin is based on. Look at, look at the headphones that he has too. He mm. has like the everything, all the helicopter equipment and the the people, the handlers at the Red Kingdom, it's like they're prepared to receive people arriving in helicopters, like they give them yeah. the step box or whatever. It's funny. But she got her man. The princess got her man. Everybody got their man. However, we are going to see a little detail that, again, critics will compare to the ending of La Belle at La Bette, where Delphine Seyrig, making her reappearance here, says to Catherine Deneuve, it's all arranged, I'm marrying your father, Try to look pleased as if she's unpleased. And that's something sort of that people compare to the ending of La Belle at La Bette, because if you remember in that movie, there's this connection we build with the beast. And then when he finally turns into the handsome pris, uh, prince, Belle has this response where she's like, oh, I'd gotten used to you as the beast. I suppose I'll have to get used to you like this again. I mean, especially in the Disney movie, that's 100 percent true. Where, like, I don't know who was in charge of animating the human beast's face, but... Because uh, he looks like Gerard Depardieu. Kind of. He, he looks hideous. Turn Old back. Gerard Depardieu. <laughs> no, he's not quite that lumpy, but <laughs> he's... It's not a good look. You, sh you should have stayed in the beast form. That's all I'm saying. But yeah, Max. This <sighs> is this is what it will be like during our first live show for the Spectator Film Podcast. Maybe someday. I Nobles hope. from all over the world. I hope it will be this serene. Yes. But yes, Max, this has been donkey skin. What do you think? Um, I know I know. I was said I, I had mixed feelings of this going in, but once I got over my expectations of what this film should be, it's such a colorful, weird film that like I feel like everybody should watch this at least once. Yeah. I can't not recommend this film to people. Yeah. Um, it might not have been what I was looking for, but I'm glad with what I found. Well, Max, can I ask you, are you do you feel pumped to watch Jacques Demy's other movies now? To a degree, yes. I know they're gonna be radically different from this, but I'm excited to see what he can do with different kinds of stories. Yeah. And he, I do think his other movies are better than this. Not all of them, but I, I do think some of the other ones are. Um, yeah, I've, I haven't seen all his movies, but uh, he had a hell of a career prior to this moment, and he still made a, f a few good movies after this. Um, so, yeah, he's a wonderful director for anyone who hasn't seen his movies. And if you enjoyed this movie, I would definitely recommend you check out the rest of his stuff as well. And uh, I'm going to just recommend uh, the whole box set that Criterion released. It's a wonderful collection. Listen, don't, don't, you, you got to stop simping for Criterion until shut, they, shut up, until they shut send up. us stuff. Uh, it's a wonderful collection. If you like this movie, if you like Jacques Demy in general, you're going to enjoy that. And also everybody who works at Criterion is incredibly attractive and <laughs> we love you. Uh, um, but yeah, if you enjoyed us talking about this incredibly beautiful movie though, you should check us out at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. You can find 
all of our episodes on that website or Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcast. We are on Instagram. We are on Letterboxd. We are on Twitter. Hell, we're even on Tumblr. We're on all sorts of cool social media platforms that kids all do. We're going to make a TikTok and do dances for you guys. We are steps away from creating an OnlyFans. Yes. Um, <laughs> if the economy keeps going down, we'll start selling. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if you're interested in any of that, uh, hit us up on all of our social media. If you want to leave a recommendation for what kind of movies we should talk about, let us know. Austin, any last words? We can't say goodbye without saying goodnight. Goodnight.